almost 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 major 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 holy fucking shit this is major Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Almost Major, where we talk about the many major studios and the films they released, and today we're on our eighth episode of our 1980s New Line Cinema miniseries. My name is Kevin Tudor, I'm here with uh, Brighton Doyle. Hello. And Charlie Nash. Hello. And joining us once again is a super special guest, it is Emily Soderback. how are you? Hi, I'm great. I'm ready to talk about the ladies club with a bunch of dudes. Hell yeah. <laughs> and guess what? I didn't like it. Deal with it. Yeah. If there's one thing I love, it's being the only woman on a podcast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I am excited to talk about this weird movie that I had never heard of uh, until you, you gave me some options. And I was like, what about this one? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That movie we are talking about is The Ladies Club from 1986. Could not find the budget, could not find opening weekend. I honestly had to look through old newspapers to figure out what date it actually came out on. You um, were like in the library looking at like the microfiche and shit. <laughs> yes. I, just, I, uh, I was in the middle of solving a murder and I was like, no, 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 I need to know the release date. Hold on, hold on. I just rewatched, I just rewatched The Ring recently because it was yes. Halloween and there's like those montages of Naomi Watts like taking the, sty- the, the stacks of newspapers and throwing them on the so ground bad. and just imagining you. Like, yeah. Oh my God. That movie is like, for like one of the... I, that was the first time I ever sought out a scary movie when I was 12 years old. Scared the absolute shit out of me. And now oh, yeah. it's like cozy comfort food. I it's can't explain it. It's the scariest PG-13 movie ever. 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 <laughs> well, have you seen Boogeyman? How about that? <laughs> also, Zone of, interest, Zone of Interest might might now qualify for oh that because I was oh, astonished no. that that was PG-13. Holy shit. I was like, wait, it is? I was just like, I couldn't believe it. Well, you don't see any actual violence. I, I swear I'll get off of this topic. The movie's not even out yet. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> he won't stop talking about Zone I of saw Interest. It yes- I saw it yesterday. I'm still recovering. <laughs> We need to do like an old school, like mid two thousands. Like critics are keep talking about Zone of Interest, and it's just and Charlie it's just outside me. of a the theater, just being like, ah, um, um. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like jump night, vi- night vision <laughs> footage of people watching Zone of Interest in the theater, and it's mostly oh just gosh. people like completely well, you, still demand well, your theater. <laughs> well, you joke, but there is like thermocam in that movie, and I'm not even kidding. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah. Um, the Ladies Club made $239,000. That's what I was aiming towards. Um, released, I think, on April 11th, 1986. Top five films that weekend. This is a complete different type of top five than the last movie. Uh, number one was The Money Pit. Uh, yeah. Police Academy 3, Back in Training. Uh, <laughs> Band of the Hand. Gung Ho and Off Beat. What's Band of the Hand? Band of the Hand, I know it. I know the title of it. Um, Gung Ho is a Ron Howard, Michael Keaton movie. What? An offbeat, I don't know. I, I, I do know what that is. It's a Judge Reinhold, Meg Tilly, Buddy Cop movie, I think. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. I think liked it. That's why I read his... I what? somehow ended up on his review and was like, oh, three and a half stars for offbeat. And not streaming anywhere. Well... <laughs> yeah, I'm adding that to my watch list right now. Band of the Hand, I, I know about because because I'm, I'm seeing it right now, Paul. That's why I know about it. Uh, but I'm, it's uh, Paul Michael Glazer from Starsky and Hutch and also the director of The Running Man. I think it's a TriStar Pictures movie, which if we ever do TriStar Pictures, we'll, we'll talk about it. Remember that horse? <laughs> yeah. it's, not, <laughs> not, it's not around anymore. <laughs> Apparently yeah. I drunkenly said I missed that horse one time to watching a movie. <laughs> <laughs> My friends just leaned over like, what? <laughs> yeah, you were watching Cold Creek Manor. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Matilda? Was that TriStar? I'm trying to think of what movies I think of when I think of TriStar. <laughs> yeah. I mean, thanks, Thanksgiving is a TriStar movie. Is it really? Mm-hmm. I guess they brought it back within the last few years. Um, anyways, number one song in the U.S. this week is Rock Me Amadeus by Falco. <laughs> okay. Cool. Uh, number one song in Canada this week is Don't Forget Me, uh, parentheses, When I'm Gone by Glass tiger uh plot description from google a policewoman played by karen austin a doctor played by christine belford and a victim sister played by diana scarwood form a vigilant group to kidnap and castrate rapists who got away with their terrible crimes i will say that they only go after repeat offenders and that does not 
line up here. Uh, based on the novel <laughs> The Sisterhood by Betty Black and Casey Bishop, this was written by Fran Lewis Ebling and Paul Mason, directed by Janet Greek, credited as A.K. Allen. More on that later. Her first film, her only other one is Spellbinder in 1988, which I watched in... Sure. Um, also directed episodes of Max Headroom, St. Elsewhere, and Babylon 5, which she did a TV movie of, starring Karen Austin as Joan Tyler. Prior to this, Jagged Edge in 1985, mostly a TV actor with appearances on St. Elsewhere, Night Court, etc. Uh, Diane Scarwood as Lucy Bricker. Prior to this, Mommy Dearest in 1981, Rumblefish and Silkwood in 1983. Hell yeah. Ooh, some good titles. Yeah, Silkwood kicks ass. Um, same year as this, uh, Psycho 3, which is directed by Anthony Perkins, who also directed Lucky Stiff, which we'll be covering later in the month. And after this, she's in What Lies Beneath in 2001 and Party Monster in 2003. Uh, Kristen Belford as Dr. Constance Lewis. Prior to this, uh, Christine in 1983. And after this, episodes of Freddy's Nightmares, Night Court, All My Children, etc., I swear we've had like five movies so far this miniseries where people have shown up in Freddy's Nightmares. I I, I don't know what that pipeline is. What about Freddy's uh, Night Courts? Uh, is that a thing? Oh, that would kick ass. <laughs> 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 he, sol- he solves cases in your dreams. Uh, yeah. Um, also starring Arliss Howard and James LaGrosse. Uh, trivia. Karen Austin got the script when it was originally called Violated and stated she didn't want to do it, but she decided to go to the meeting because the director was a woman. Her only complaint later on was that the marketing of the film with the tagline, quote, men who attack women have two big problems. The ladies club is about to remove them both. $200,000 at me. Um, director Janet Greek had her name listed as AK Allen due to complaints over the way that the finished film was marketed. Um, random, but I gotta bring this up because I had to go get a subscription on newspapers.com to get this info on this movie because it's just, <laughs> wow. there's nothing out there about it. And I found two reviews from the Philadelphia Inquirer that said, uh, that had two of these reviews had similar quips to the point where I was like, who plagiarized who? <laughs> um, one, the Philadelphia Inquirer said, quote, a, su- a sewing circle, this is not. Um, <laughs> and then another from the Carrier Post that said, a Tupperware party, it's not. <laughs> Motherfuckers had comedy What's like on lock. Tupperware party? Is that, are people just making shit up to like make <laughs> yeah. for jokes? Like, I don't, You've never heard of a Tupperware party? I don't think I know what that is. Maybe it's before my time. Uh well, it's also before my time, but <laughs> but it's like I think people would like get around and like sell Tupperware. It's like selling Avon. It's like it's huh. kind of like the original multi-level marketing scheme, like where housewives would buy a bunch of shit and then sell it to people, and it, they would make it a party so people would come and like drink, like you know, in like Edward Scissorhands, the like Avon stuff. Right. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Like stuff like that. No, uh, yeah. Thank you. I I didn't know about that, so I I stand corrected on that saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, you guys are invited to my Tupperware party. <laughs> um, I really hope you like what I've picked out. Prince would listen to that and be like, wait, you motherfuckers just sit around talking about bowls? Really? Okay. <laughs> um, and then in that same Philly Inquirer review, the movie critic Carrie Ricky claims that this is the first feminist exploitation movie, which I didn't look into that. I didn't have time, but sure. Um, I bet there is one before this, but there's, it's still... I think there has to be. It's 86. Yeah. She she brought up, like, unless you want to bring up Miss 45, which something, something, something. I always I just... want to bring up Miss 45. Well, yeah. I mean, come on now. It could happen to any woman. Anywhere. Anytime. <clears throat> but it happened to them. Something's got to be done. They watch the law in action. My God, they look like angels. Only 2% of these guys ever get convicted. And they've seen the guilty go free. We feel that justice has been served, and that's all that's important to us. They've been victims once. Well, damn it, something did happen. I was raped. But they won't be victims again. It just seems so hopeless. No, it's not. Not if we put them permanently out of commission. The Ladies Club. Go after the career rapists. Ed, listen, I'm going to be late for the meeting. They have their get-togethers. What we're doing is extremely dangerous. Their committees. The team that picks up the man is never the same team that releases him. Their rules. Wait! Under no circumstances is a team to split up. Their plans. I'm so scared for you. Welcome to the club. What they feel goes beyond revenge. This is just like an operating room. 
people. What did you expect? What they do goes beyond the law. They joined with a common cause <laughs> and found a simple solution. Now, I don't actually do it. A doctor does it. You're one of those nuts I've been hearing about on the news. It's quick and permanent. Damn it, how could you do such a thing? They're taking justice into their own hands <laughs> and hitting them where it hurts. The Ladies Club. I think I need to uh, sit down for a minute. It's not just coffee and cake anymore. That's all the trivia I could find, and I had to use the same things that Summer said used in Seven, that library, to get all that information. <laughs> so, um, initial thoughts. Uh, this was everybody's first watch. Um, I will go first. Um, so, about 20 minutes into this, I had to look up and see if this was actually a movie that New Line put out and not like an ABC movie of the week or something, but then I had to, because I didn't want to have to tell you, I'll be like, sorry, we made a mistake, this didn't go to theaters, but no, this indeed did go to theaters. Unfortunately, this isn't very good. Uh, it's a fantastic premise that's done in such a, like, bland and robotic way everything is told in the most dry way possible like none of the characters feel like human beings everything is just kind of thrown to the side at the end to have a nice tied up in a nice bow at the end uh it's unfortunate because i like i said fantastic premise and to have the story in theaters in 1986 is pretty nuts it didn't go wide and only made a quarter of a million dollars but still and it feels like an indie studio that was like trying to glossy up an exploitation movie from like the late 70s but still being stuck in like the early 80s slasher craze where it has to be like a police procedural i don't know it's not all bad there's a character that says i think we should string them up and cut off their balls i took a poll at my beauty shop and 75 percent of women agreed so <laughs> that was perfect. that is a really good line <laughs> like actual <laughs> data back in. that's really good <laughs> And uh, also there's a shot of the front of a newspaper with the headline that simply states, Man Castrated. You know, that's that's all, that's all the headline you need. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't have much to say other than this. Is, I, I wish I got more out of this. Uh, Spellbinder, probably a better movie. Just because, one, it seems like it has more money behind it. And it's also just like, what if there were witches? And I was like, hell yeah, why not? Yeah, yeah, I added that to my list as soon as I looked up the director. <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> Uh, Emily, what do you think? Um, I mean, I was stoked on this because I do think I think the marketing got me, and it looks what kind of way more exploitation-y than it is. Like that poster I I posted on my Twitter, the violated poster looks like some like Savage Streets shit, you know? Yeah, like it looks, it looks dope as shit. It looks yeah. really rad. Um, but for most of this movie, it was a very kind of like eighties Lifetime esque movie where it was a lot of you know women talking gently to each other about sexual assault which is important and I guess it's good that these conversations were on a big screen um also bonkers that the <laughs> that the solution was to round up just how like organized they were about it like has to be repeat offenders we have you know there's a cops on mm -hmm. our in our club so we have their records uh, uh -huh. we have a doctor so we uh -huh. can definitely castrate them um and then we have this lady who doesn't have a job and she doesn't have family so she can help in any way <laughs> that she can yeah. um, also i yeah. have a solution that i can put in a flask it'll knock them out for the appropriate time to get them did them to exactly. the house <laughs> but like as organized as it was it was really chaotic in that like they weren't really being that careful no, um, no. it ramped i liked how it ramped up at the end that was cool but it was just it's you know slow going looked shitty even though the cinematographer is adam greenberg who's done like yeah every single movie <laughs> terminator terminator 2 rush hour oh wow near wow. dark that's, sister that's act <laughs> near dark damn holy yeah. shit and then he was like also the ladies club well yeah <laughs> but i mean like the composers lalo Schifrin, oh the guy gosh. that did like, Dirty Airy? Uh, like, are you fucking kidding me? What did y'all think Incredible. of the score? I thought the score was... Bad. Atrocious. I mean, used badly, yeah. but also, like, holy crap. I mean, like, those saxophones... I don't even remember it. I mean, well, so yeah. much so saxophone. It must have just been not great. <laughs> okay, but it's the same guy who did the score for the cat from outer space 
and also bringing down the house. So maybe Dirty Harry is like an outlier. Um, well, I also saw the, he uh-huh. did the bullet score, and I remember this. I was trying to remember the score. Oh, yeah. I remember the score like in the the car chase, like like when it's like sort of ramping up before like you know cuts out and they're all like you know squealing tires and stuff. But uh, he, yeah. he also did the score for the new kids, which you just watched, Brighton. Yes, I don't oh, really yeah, remember the score. I just remember that '80s rock song that they played like during the training montages. <laughs> mm, okay, I just remember that bleach blonde hair. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> wait a minute adam greenberg shot snakes on a plane and we're talking about terminator like who gives a shit um <laughs> no, the, the, uh, the one r-rated movie i got kicked out of for sneaking into <laughs> nice. was snakes on a plane <laughs> uh don't forget he also shot inspector gadget and santa claus 2 oh hell yeah <laughs> so hell yeah oh and he also shot her other movie spellbinder okay, okay. renaissance man that's a terrible film north um pretty sure roger ebert like got like 10 years of his life removed by watching that movie uh, has anybody seen north no. i don't think no. so okay. but i'm morbidly curious okay. <laughs> i'm very morbidly curious yeah anyways is that all you had to say emily or are we just going to keep talking about i'm Greenberg mean, movies okay i kind of do want to keep talking about, i mean he also yeah. shot jocks from 1986 oh <laughs> whatever that is <laughs> uh, right. no, but this movie you know i, I admired its uh story and I really, I think my favorite part uh, was the final scene, which we, we can talk about when we get there. The yeah. phone call. <laughs> okay, I just clicked on jocks after you mentioned that. Okay. <laughs> and apparently Mariska Hargitay is in this movie. Oh, so ah, shit. Now. <laughs> Do a Law and Order film fest where you just watch movies featuring the cast oh, of that God. <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit. That Christopher was... Lee's the president. All right. Whoa. <laughs> okay. No, now we have to watch this. Spellbinder and Jocks, double feature. <laughs> it has been logged by five people that I follow. <laughs> Soon to be four more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, the background photo, I don't know what this background photo is, but Marissa Gargate is making a kind of eh face. Like, <laughs> I don't know what this is. <laughs> Welcome to the Jocks pod. Um, hmm. <laughs> This seems also impossible to find, but I will I will find it and let everybody know. Charlie, initial thoughts? Um, I just watched this movie like like two hours ago. Um I I agree. I, I, I found it interesting. I was never bored. I I I I don't disagree that like aesthetically it's kind of lacking and kind of you know it it, it feels a little I don't know if even stilted's the right word but it definitely feels like of a time of the 1980s and then but there was a part of me that like maybe halfway through that was like I you know Kevin you kept bringing up it looks like a made for TV movie and I was like if this was a made for TV movie that's kind of awesomely radical <laughs> even if like I don't know I found there to be something a little interesting about how deeply like mel- like kind of melodramatic stick to it's so heightened in the in the very in in the rage and the grief and the anger of these characters in a way that I found I'm not like this stuff you know we've talked about how this stuff obviously existed before 1986 but I I, I will say I found it pretty fascinating as maybe not if, if even if it didn't all work dramatically or aesthetically I found it very fascinating as like kind of a, a time capsule for these 1980s slasher films it also made me think of I mean I think this is a better film but uh, a friend of mine um got me to watch the film blood games uh last oh, yeah. month for the first time which I also kept thinking about that which if you haven't seen that one uh definitely check that out and that's kind of that's an interesting one because it's like set up as a rape revenge movie, but there really is no revenge. It's basically just them fighting for their lives with is baseball bats. Is that the baseball movie? Yes. yes. Yeah. That movie's mean and nasty, but in all sorts of like ways that subvert the rape revenge genre that yeah. I was kind of expecting from this one. And this one I do, but this one I also admire in the almost the exact opposite way where they're like, yeah, we're rape revenge and we're just going to play it completely straightforward. And I don't know. I can't think of another movie that is it is it kind of like a, a, a exploitation film that might play on Lifetime. Sure. But I also was like, I can't think of a bunch of other movies that are just like this that are also so nakedly like empathetic to the, the female characters in their rage. Like it just kind of cuts to the point of they were assaulted. They're pissed. They want revenge. And I kind of admired just how you know, it doesn't really try and do anything else other than just kind of put you in their shoes. And the, I will also say, I mean, it is tough going at the beginning. The opening scene of this is really Mm, horrific. And the, 
it's awful. Like I, I, I mentioned off camera, but I just got, I just started a new job that's a little emotionally taxing and I've just finished my second day of work. So I was like, okay, I got to watch this for the pot. And I was like, good Lord, this is tough to take. Not and you watch thing. Zone of Interest too. I mean, <laughs> God damn take it, a I'm shot. never going to live this down. <laughs> well played. Uh, and, but, um, but it also felt, you know, especially like, you know, coming from a, a female director, like it all felt very authentic and not just played for shock value. Like it all, it all came from a deeply authentic place of hurt that I ultimately respect, very much respect. And even if it's a little sloppy, I mean, it's all very contrived, but I, I kind of loved it that instead of like getting, you know, it's like, what if, you know, we had a book club, but it was all about going after rapists. I love that. Like, I don't know. Like, I just kind of, yeah. there's like scenes of them getting all, the... Yeah, when they're all in the living room and it's like every, all the women, they're all like in their little sweaters, just like, yeah, what should we do? It, I it thought that great. was kind of wonderful I in its own like twisted way. Yeah, I don't know. I and found there's there's the, zero the pushback whatsoever no. when they're just yeah, like, yeah, 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 we should castrate them. We're just like, okay, how should we do that? And like, there's yeah, nobody no that's opposes. just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, I, I kind of love that, that they found yeah. their own little community. And ultimately, I do think the ending, I know you said it wraps up in a tight, in a bow, Kevin. I I read it a little, uh, as a little more sad, personally. Well, I, yeah. I found it to be like, oh shit, we, without spoiling anything just yet, oh shit, we got too sloppy and let this get the best of us, we need to wrap this up, and then it... It, no, like they're they they have ever a they have every right to feel this way, but also b they're too consumed by their justifiable rage and you know trauma that I found the ending well not exactly unexpected but in any way very you know I, I I thought that was actually a very fine note to end on honestly and 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 is messier than um than I I I just wouldn't say it's like all like pristine I don't know oh yeah you know. It was more so that it was just like, we have like all of these women, because I'm pretty sure like the second to the last scene is like, um, like the doctor kills herself and then she, then the main character is like, oh shit, I got to go home. And then it's just like everybody else kind of like none of their plot lines get wrapped up. It just, they're just like, ah shit, we need to like focus on one person so that we can end this shit. And I was kind of worried that it was going to end with the doctor just killing themselves. Cause then oh, yeah. I think that would have been ending on like, not, not that, that, not that I had any problem with that, but if that was what it ended on and that's what the message was, I would, I would have been like, um, what's that's your message? Fun. Don't do anything. Yeah, yeah. Everything's like, bad. Yeah. Like then yeah, it would have been, been a like, little fatalist. Yeah. And, and I like that, you know, I should have known because you know, those get those, those characters keep popping back up. So I should have, you know, I should have known that it, they would come back for one last, you know. Yeah. Uh, there's another movie because you were talking about uh, Deadly Games. Is that what it's called? Uh, Blood Games. Blood, Blood Games. Games. Oh, yeah. Deadly um, Games is good too, though. Uh, there's a movie that I was going to watch like right after this. It's called A Gun for Jennifer from 1997. And Vinegar Syndrome actually just announced this on Friday that they're putting this out. And it's a Ooh. similar thing where... Uh, a woman escapes an abusive husband and gets entangled with murderous female vigilantes who prey on abusive men. The tagline is dead men don't rape. Like, Whoa. yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> I'm watching the shit out of this. Yeah, yeah, sold. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but anyways, uh, Bryden, initial thoughts? Uh, yeah, so I hadn't, like, oh, like all of us, I hadn't seen this before. I, I think it's... I would say the movie becomes more under style, uh, becomes more under stylized as it goes on, which is a part of the problem. Um, but I do think that um, there is, I did kind of like the abrasive um, style at the start of the movie. I'm, and when I say that, I, I mean specifically to like a couple of scenes. Um, the the scene where it's the doctor at her home alone and she's like seeing like the photos. Uh, she's looking at the photo of her kid, and then like you get those very brief like sort of still shot, still inserts of like her daughter dead and like her and and the guy who 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 killed her and attacked her like i did sort of and there's also that sort of uh, abrasive like abrupt editing uh where in, in the courtroom scene when it's um cutting between like the case not going well for uh for karen austin and then like her also at target practice and everything sort of like sh- sort of mm-hmm. to show like the violent emotions that are sort of like in her as she's going through this very very grueling ordeal um i did like that sort of rhythm to the movie and i wish actually they kind of kept that up like throughout the movie and then i feel like kind of the slickness is almost kind of the problem with the movie and everything how it does become sort of more a little more by the numbers in its direction or anything where like you know the the bulk of their endeavor is like conveyed in like a montage score to look 
This is not. Uh, I, I didn't hate this movie, but this is maybe one of the worst scores I've heard in a movie recently. <laughs> it, it is like it's like it's. I mean, it's one. It's so suited to the moment or anything. Like all that heavy saxophone and like you know squelching keyboard synths and um and then uh, squelching. Yeah, I, I mean, yes, that is kind of the dope. Whenever some like, yeah, yeah. it's which is like not really appropriate for. It. I mean, that also makes the movie feel a little sleazier than it, than it than it probably is, and it's sort of like torn between the genre instincts and like the sort of more uh psychological uh interests of like the the characters and what they're going through yeah i feel like it doesn't really know what it wants to be it's like should we be a drama should we be like a crime like court thriller should we just like go straight like we are castrating these men like should we just like really lean into that like the kind of bait and switch thing that they were doing it's kind of all over the place like that exactly i would and either one of those movies could be good but like when it's kind of mushed together especially when it's like such a short run time i mean we're talking about like the ending it's like kind of like i'm a when you said it's like wrapped up in about some of the some of the the, the ideas that it's like you know wrapping up too easily I, I i agree with charlie i think there is some ambiguity in the ending but like it comes so quickly like i was like when we, I'm, we were getting in the home structure movie i was like how does this movie wrap up like in 15 minutes like it's like it's really it really just like, kind of just like race through all the beats when like really like some of the stuff that's happening, especially with the doctor, that should be happening like at the halfway point and everything. And then like the rest of the movie should be dealing with the follow and sort of like the, the different feelings that the characters have. Um, but yeah, you don't really, you get a sense of the, who the characters are with um, Karen Austin, Diana Scarwood, and uh, is it Christine Elford? Uh, who's the doctor? Um, I want to get the actor's name right. Uh, Christine Belford. 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 Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, you get a sense Christine of... Christine Belfast from three years ago, yes. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> but uh, you, you get a sense of who they are as characters, but then everyone else in the group, they all... They mostly just like kind of blend together. They are defined by kind of what they're mostly doing in in like the group, uh, and not really given like a whole lot of character. And like you know, not, not a lot of scenes of, like them interacting with each other, which would just be like it would be interesting to see the interplay between them. And you don't really get a lot of it because I guess there's just like there's only so much time in the movie. I, I like some of the ideas in this movie. I just wish the execution was a little bit better, a, 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 a little more interesting. And yeah, like Emily, Emily, like you said, like I if it had picked like a a more decisive uh, tone to stick with it probably would have uh, worked a little bit better. But as is, it's just kind of like stuck in the middle. But um, it's not not entirely without merit. There's like, there's interesting things to talk about here. Did they know that um, Karen Austin's character was a cop? Because I don't think we did. Like, I think it just starts with them, like, you know, knifing through the screen window. And I think then we it's know revealed. when they look at her photo. We, we know when they know. Yes. We find yes. out at the same time. Because that's the other thing. I mean, that's the I can't help but think about like it is that, that's the other thing that I was like, I mean, considering our the way that we've been, you know, very openly talking about politics in relation to the police over uh, since 1986. I did think that was kind of an interesting thing. Like that is an interesting aspect to it that I don't think the film really does much with other than, yeah, just basically says, yeah, well, we have access to more information as a mm -hmm. result. But I did. But I can't help but be fascinated by the fact that. I found it interesting that, you know, the police, the people who were, you know, especially in the 1980s, <laughs> were providing a, a much more, uh, you know, we weren't talking about the corruption as explicitly with, you know, military police forces at that time. But even the fact that a cop is the one who's like, let's get this shit together, I did think was an interesting aspect. I don't know. I think, I mean, it's kind of supporting the, the idea that even with all of the supposed power women are still helpless even if they are put into to masculine positions of power they're still helpless mm -hmm. in their own protection of their of their bodies um yes. i mean and that's even shown like that guy who won't stop like flirting with her and like hitting on her in the office and everything and oh yeah and how mm -hmm. how light how lightly everyone in the in the police station is taking it and how she kind of she can't even use her own means as being a police officer to solve her case or get justice like even then, like she has to go outside of that and uh, join a castration club. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I also thought a little bit about the Catherine Bigelow film, Blue Steel, which is, mm. I think, underappreciated and also gets into, you know, that, that sort of stuff with relationship to cops and mm -hmm. uh, killers and rapists so a little more explicitly and a little more it, the gray area with that subject matter in that occupation uh, is more defined. I'm Maybe I'm not, maybe I'm just grasping at straws because I don't think the film is entirely, I think you did such a great job of summing up what I was trying to process, Emily, because um, maybe it is more just trying to be a little more simple than that. 
but I, 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 I couldn't help but be struck by like, oh, that's how the movie starts. And then after that. So, yeah. so what you're saying is you want Melissa Hargitay to be in this movie. Oh, God. <laughs> Um, uh, I like the point. Um, I, I like that you mentioned uh, Emily. The Bruce Davison is the the cop who like is really persistent. It's weird because he's so pers- he's so creepy when he's like hitting on her and like you know she's like you know he just like won't take no for an answer. But then he is like he does seem like weirdly understanding and, t- and attentive in the scene when they have dinner and like she's like you know opening it up and everything. He is trying to well, I mean he all, she also tells him to leave and he doesn't. So it's like it's kind of like kind of all over the place. But um, it is interesting how like the movie does sort of like show how like the shittiness and man does isn't just like in the forms of like these attackers who are like, you know, present throughout the the whole movie and everything, but it also comes in like kind of more insidious, normal, you know, forms and everything like Arliss Howard's character who like mm-hmm. seems like, Oh, he's like the loving dad who makes, you know, breakfast for the kids. But then like, it starts out in kind of weird ways where he's like saying, Hey, you're not going to give me a kiss on the way out to his wife. And then like, you know, when he's like grabbing her arm, when he just does confront her, about what she's been doing um yeah I, I thought that was interesting how like it is like kind of just like this sort of male dominance is like sort of present like in all different it, it comes in like, like various forms and some of it is like you know it, it's villainy is like not always like quite apparent on the surface is like how it would yeah it. yeah it's villainy is not always like physical violence either it's also like oh why aren't you over this yet like why yeah. can't you just yeah. move on like you can't do if you can't do anything about it then then let's just move on with your life and it's and at one point i think she's saying that her like people were more upset that she got beat up than than raped Oof. and it was like yeah. i don't know it's just not yeah, reaching that's the what her husband said yeah yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah would we like to go through the plot right sure we can go through the plot okay. um so yeah the movie starts out um karen austin is uh, is a police officer she comes home and the movie's cutting between her like sort of going about her day and these three young uh, these three young men who have like broken into her house. What, instead of uh, finding out who she Emma, finding out who she is and Emma, and running it away, they decide to stay and attack her. And there's a very long scene where you know uh, she is like you know fighting back Emma, and uh, it seems like she's gonna get away, but then they they do attack her. And then when she wakes up in the hospital, uh, she's met by a doctor played by Christy Belford, who is very sympathetic and very gentle towards her, trying to like sort of ease her back ease her back into the world and reorient her like emily said like a lot of people are saying like what well, it's not just the men who are saying like why don't you oh, to her why don't you just get over it it's also like even when she goes to see a a therapist who's who's a woman at like the, the hospital like the person says like look you're just gonna have to like move on with your life and everything that's the only way you're gonna get better it's really not helpful she just become friends with christine belford but then she goes through who and christy belford who's who's lost her own daughter to uh not only sexual violence but also was murdered she uh after Karen uh, Austin's case does not go well. She is uh, the, 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 the crooks are found not guilty. When she goes to attack them outside of the courthouse, the, we freeze frame and then like zoom out into uh, into a newspaper. And it's Diana Scarwood who is uh, who is reading the newspaper and uh, she's really struck by it. And Arliss Howard, uh, who by the way I've seen three. <laughs> yeah, this is the third Arliss Howard movie I've seen this month because he's also in The Killer and I also watched him in this Martha Coolidge movie Plain Clothes where he plays an undercover cop at a high school. Uh, so November's just a month of Arliss Howard, I guess. Um, yeah. Who is he in The Killer? He's the client. He's at the, the client. End with like the toque. Oh, oh, he's so yeah. he's so yeah. good at that. I, I, with I the four AD shirt, yeah. yeah, or the sub pop shirt, my bad. Yeah. Uh, Christmas bonuses will be light this year, uh, but he's so good at that. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, um, Arliss Howard uh, tell, tells her, says like, look, you, you can't get upset about that. Like, you know, and then, you know, it's like, you know, she, she has a right to feel how she wants to feel. And then it's revealed that one of the reasons why this is so close to her, this is so close to home for her is because she has a sister who is catatonic, uh, having her hair brushed and like having to be fed because when she was a teenager, she was... Um, she was raped by uh, a guy who would who is like a repeat offender. Like he had like just been out like I think for like a couple of days, and uh, has been so traumatized by the incident that she doesn't doesn't speak and is terrified whenever she's in the presence of a man, including uh, Scarwood's husband, Harless Howard. Austin ends up getting a bunch of letters uh, from people who were like you know outpouring of support for her, including from Scarwood and all the women who have written the letters. They get invited to sort of this uh, get together where they could sort of talk about their own experiences, and there is kind of like a a little session where they all talk about it and what they can do and sort of their own feelings of frustration about how they're not able to respond to it. It's interesting how they all kind of like, it, it, the movie does sort of like hint to this and then it, it, it really is just following this one approach that the, the characters take to it. But like, it is interesting how like not everyone deals with it in the same way. And like, you know, there's the one person who said, 
and it, it shows how like it, it can sort of um the insecurity that people can feel about how like they don't they cope with it and everything like one person one character says to another woman like you know you didn't go to your have you ever been to a, tra- a rape trial and the person says like no i didn't want to go because i was like you know upset and everything and it's like you know everyone has different ways of processing it which you know i think is like a really interesting thing for the movie to explore um and then the group sort of gets whittled down from there uh because like everyone has very conflicting ideas but the people who do like really want to make take some decisive action specifically castration uh they they form their own club it's uh belford who is going to be like you know medically administering the process er, er, the, the process yeah she's they're going to be doing it and we, we sort of went through like their whole process of like how they they do that and um you're right though that they're not subtle about it they talk about how like they're supposed to like not use the same teams every time and also like they say something about like look different but not too different and everything but it seems like they're right. mostly just going out as themselves there's not like you know i mean well yeah and that's shown when that guy when that one guy recognizes that lady and calls her husband exactly yeah, yeah. like they're really not disguising them they're not being careful at all actually no i mean it maybe would have no. like tilted the movie into goofiness if they were wearing like wigs and like you know elaborate wigs. costumes i was thinking the exact same thing okay, like, that there was like ass. a goofy a goofy disguise <laughs> yes. montage or one something one of those like mustache like uh, glasses <laughs> like <laughs> would you like a drink from my flask <laughs> <laughs> And they all have like different accents. I yeah. swear you'll have your balls when you wake up. <laughs> Promise. <laughs> I will say that the scene where they get the guy, they castrate him, and then bring him back to the bar, and then oh, fucking it. fuck off, and then they just like stand there while he goes into the bathroom. He's just like, ah, <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. And then later they said he had like he broken all the urinals and like busted through the door and <laughs> like it was entire, adam sandler and punch yeah. drunk love and shit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, poli- yeah, exactly. the entire police station was laughing about it also i love her friend her po- her the other police officer woman who's just like has like such a thick accent she's like laughing at everything and she's like talking about how funny it is that this guy doesn't have his balls anymore <laughs> and they were like oh yeah the station half of us say he should be they should charge the the perp with burglary or like yeah or like theft and the other half says <laughs> we should charge him with assault yeah so good. It's, <laughs> it's it's also funny that like she's giving like that again like the person who said like i pulled some uh, pull my bar my beauty salon they yeah. said 75 percent. it's like also half the people say this half the people say that it's like people are just like taking polls all the time lots of, of polls like... <laughs> really lots of polls yeah, yeah. <laughs> now no no, no. If you can hear me <laughs> over your over your setting machine with your hair and whatnot should we castrate men yes or no <laughs> I'm just, okay. I'm just imagining like a ladies club Twitter page where it's all polls, like mm-hmm. <laughs> just all polls of like, stuff. what should we do next? Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to know what they keep in these Tupperware bins. Anyways, oh Brian, go ahead. Goodness. Um, <laughs> uh, so like, like I said, it's kind of weird, like the movies pacing or anything, how like a lot of like their activities are kind of just relegated to the, to montage. Uh, so, said to this, this terrible score <laughs> it can't be overstated how bad it is and how it's like it's like bounce weirdly like bouncy for a movie that is like you know not really that tone the three big confrontations that you really see are um the first one with the, with the, the guy who attacked um diana scarwood's sister we talked about that and then there's the second one where it's um the guy in the bar who you know and like the, the first attacker that they got was like you know a guy who's like wearing a toque and like you know very ratty looking clothes and everything whereas this guy's like a well-dressed like you know business type almost he's wearing like you know a suit and tie and everything again showing how like evil can come on all forms one woman is just sort of it seems like she's just like run into him by happenstance and everything you know she'd been pursuing him i think for like a while like you know trying to like track him down and then like she just ran into him and she's like you know they're alone at the bar and she calls diana scarwood for help that's how like arvis howard says like oh you're going to your meeting you know and again he's being super weird and creepy where he's like saying like oh what's more important meeting your me it's like you know she's asking him to like celebrate his promotion he's like kissing her and um then diana scarwood shows up She's spotted by the family friend who calls all Arvos Howard and everything. And then um the the businessman then runs off with uh with Scarwood. And I will say Scarwood plays this moment very well and everything, where she thinks like it's like the guy's like saying, Look, she knows that he's evil and everything, but like he's saying that he's going to an- another club and she says, Hey, that's like the wrong direction. And then he's and then she says, Are we going there? And he like he drops like any like pretenses of like being a, a nice guy. He says, No. And the, you do hold like a shot of her for a while as she's just like trying to act calm but also you see her eyes like kind of dirty and she's like realizing like oh i don't know where i'm gonna do what i'm gonna do with this situation but she's already like he's already she's already offered him the flask you know while they're driving so by the time they get to like sort of the rocky area where he plans to attack her he does 
manage to pass it. He does pass out about just before he could really do anything. After that, she goes home to Arliss Howard, who then like confronts her about what she's been doing. And I will say, him finding out like that like she's not actually going to book club made me think of uh, the show Yellow Jackets, where uh, Melanie Linsky, she's like throughout that first season, she's having like an affair and like also like you know taking out like some vigilante justice and everything. And like you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, her husband like finds out about an affair. He like she says something like, I, I can't believe you thought I like was going to book club. He's like, What? There's no book club? And I just like thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> the entire time during this Arliss, Arliss Howard scene. Um, but uh, just just the entire time being like, I swear to God, I castrate men. And he's just like, not even like, no, you're kidding. He was just like, wait, really? You know, like, I would, <laughs> would not believe my spouse. Yeah. and be like, wait, are you going to castrate stop? men? No. You castrate men? Why don't you just tell me you're cheating on me? Like, no, I really castrate men. It's just like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. And then he like grabs her arm and says like, you didn't even think about like what would happen if you got caught. And, you know, I'm going to like take away the kids. And then um, she like says like, she like stands firm in her beliefs and says like, no, like I like, I, like to think about like, you know, my sister never getting better from some end because of something like this happening. Like I can't let something like this happen again. I think then we see the the two women have like, you know, are like going off for the night. It's also interesting, like, you know, the way that like the group operates and anything like they're able to like sort of work in shifts where like, you know, after like they get like the first guy, the two people who like lured him in, they just like, it's like, all right, I'm going to prep him for surgery. You two can go off for the night. You're totally good. And then they just sort of walk and we're like, Whew, that was something and then uh they leave and they have not told and the movie's being coy about who they've left behind uh and then when belford takes off the sheet uh she's she like looks and then like turns on the light and realizes that it's the person who attacked her kid and uh, attacked and killed her kid and then like very like she kind of like goes into a daze there and like grabs the knife and like stabs him and then slices his throat pretty good special effect shot where like you know she like you know she does like you know you see the like the, the lines mm-hmm. sort of like form across his uh, his throat and it, like as the blood just sort of spurts for like a second. That's that is really uh, especially because this movie isn't like wall to wall with like you know graphic violence. Uh, it it, do, it does stick out. And then um, Belford is like good in this moment where you see her like sort of like back up against the wall and like you know like turn over her hand as she sort of comes out of it. And then she does um, go up to her room and injects herself with some kind of thing. I don't, it's not clear what it is, but but it's a it's enough of a substance that she. She, she dies and she dies with her with her daughter's uh, picture in her hand. And then the group, when they find out about this, they're they're devastated. And Austin is the one, like we said, who wants to stop. And there's some uh, there's some uh, conflict about this. You know, Diana Scarwood wants to keep going. And uh, this is where it's kind of interesting about like everyone taking different approaches to this and everything. Like they all kind of like turn to Austin as the one. And I guess it's maybe because she is a cop and everything and knows about like, you know, has like access to records and everything. They say, like, what are you going to do, like, next time this happens or anything? And Austin does not respond well. Her response to, like, saying, I'll feel sorry is maybe, like, she... It's maybe not the right tone and everything, but, like, it is, like, maybe... I don't know. Do we think it's fair to, like, for everyone to kind of... They... Or maybe I'm, maybe I'm misreading it. Of, like, are they putting all the responsibility of this protection onto this one person? I, I, I mean, I'm curious to maybe hear some thoughts on this yeah. scene. I'll, I'll leave it to everyone here. I feel like it's... It becomes a blame game no matter what, whether it's people, uh, whether it's like the trial and, and, you know, you know, what were you wearing? What did, how did you provoke this person? Or even with these women and how, how are we going to fix this problem? They shouldn't have to be the ones fixing the problem in the first place, but then it kind of devolves into this. Well, this is the only thing we can do. The only way we can feel like we're actually taking action, we're actually taking steps to solve something the only thing we came up with is we get these guys we castrate them so if we can't do that then we're doing nothing and that makes us part of the problem and that's not right like they shouldn't feel like that obviously but that's the only power that they had in that moment was this this uh ladies club that they were in so not having that (laughs) it's almost like they're they would be angry because they're not doing anything and it's you know it obviously shouldn't be anyone's fault and yeah you should feel sorry because you can't you can't really go around castrating people anyways yeah <laughs> says you <laughs> we, we can't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> one other thing i think is interesting um is um uh, I, I I like everything that you said. I, I, I get the, the the point about the playing game. That's a very good point. Uh, it's also interesting when uh, there have been some movies uh, that are in, that fit into the subgenre of the rape revenge and everything about like who is like taking the the vengeance for whom? Is it for themselves or is it in the name of someone else? I know that was. I'm not going to start this discourse a bit again about this movie because goodness knows there was enough discourse about it. And that's we fine. know but, where you're going. But with promising young woman, I know, know where you're people going. People said like yeah. it's like it's revealed like she's taking vengeance for someone who's not even in the movie anymore. Like they're they're dead and everything. I know some people were, were really upset by that choice. And Ladies Club 
they don't deal into this they don't deal with this complexity it, like look you would need a long movie to deal with this probably but like uh, about like you know the fact that like they're doing it for for people who have been attacked or people or people that they know uh have been attacked uh or people they know have been attacked uh and, and I, I don't know this is obviously a very complex issue and everything but it's just interesting that the movie like you know it's a it's an, it's an interesting threat that the movie does pull on and i'm not saying the movie needs to pull on that threat but that was just something that was rattling around in my head and that's that's all i'll say about it i think i mean i thought of it too i mean also i mean also Saltburn just came out and <laughs> there's i feel like promising young woman is also coming back up in what are we discourse doing as a result of the, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God damn. laughs> what are we doing <laughs> you know what else just came out Zone of interest. God damn it. God damn it. And we're back. And I know, and I know Charlie's movies. seen it. I know yeah, Charlie's one seen those, it. One of those movies is good and one is very bad. Uh, and I say that as someone who like Promising Young Woman. And I think Kevin can agree with me on that. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, have you seen, what, what's your take on Promising Young Woman? Emily? What are we doing? Please go ahead. <laughs> I've, I've, se- I, I've seen a, a lot better uh, rape revenge movies. Okay. I did like the soundtrack a lot, and I did love the casting choice in all of the soft boy, nice guy comedians. That's my favorite part of the movie, too. Yes. To, to cast. Yeah. And yeah. that's all I'll say. That's, yeah. Totally fair. Absolutely. I have never wanted to talk more about Ladies Club right now. <laughs> 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 and I love Promising Young Woman, but it's also just the air of that movie just makes me want to be like, radio silence, please. Good or bad opinions, I just <laughs> well now I'm done. well now Saltburn can take over from there. But anyway, that's fine. All all I'll yeah. say is just like movie bad. Next question. Oh <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So Karen Austin goes home thinking she's done with it, and yes, like uh, we we alluded to it earlier, but throughout the movie, the the, the people who attacked her at the start of the movie have been popping up uh, throughout uh, because they've been arrested for just like kind of any minor crime and everything. The police are looking for any way to like lock them back up and everything, whether it's like you know Lloyd like spitting in the street and everything, like they'll like lock them up, and um, that's like. And when she comes home, she is confronted by the ringleader of the of the criminals, who is uh, who has like now has like a personal grudge for how she is the one being blamed for, it, even though she's not even the one who is you know going out and arresting these guys. You know, it's like her her love interest Bruce Davison and everything, who's like you know doing a lot of that stuff. It was interesting to see him in this movie. I never would have expected to see a young Bruce Davison in this movie. <laughs> I, I only see I, I I mean I primarily know him as like the he's like the is he a set is he a senator in X Men? I know he's like the guy who turns to like goop in the first movie yeah he, uh, he, yeah, he turns into water yeah. Yeah. he just um, turns into a giant puddle Brighton, in X-Men Brighton, he was in Get a Job in 2016 how oh, do you not know this man of course how could I forget <laughs> me the Dylan Kid Scholar um but, um, <laughs> so, Davis is, <laughs> I mean I don't, I don't know much about his early roles was he like kind of like typecast I, I feel like I've heard he was like typecast as creeps a lot in the early part of his career is that kind of he like played, he played the original Willard yeah I need to see that yeah um, other than that, I mean, I I pretty ignorant about his early career or most of it. Really, he was just in get a yeah. He wasn't mostly, <laughs> mostly just get a job in Willard. That's all I know about. I um, forgot he was in Lords of Salem. Oh, and he is in Crimes of Passion too. That's a good one. That's a good. I, that that's a that's a good, uh, trashy movie. Uh, Kathleen Ken Russell. It's Kathleen Turner. Turner. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> she has a line where she goes, "I've never forget a face, especially one I've sat on." Oh, where I was like, "Oh my." <laughs> Incredible stuff. Yeah. <laughs> he was in 8mm too. Bryden continues. Ah, okay. Um, well, I need to see 8mm once so I can understand 8mm too. Um, <laughs> fuck yes, he do. <laughs> Movie's kind of okay. <laughs> I remember, can I just say, my roommate saw 8mm as a kid and was like, it's even more fucked up than 7. I was like, okay, let's watch it. And then like halfway through, he was like, oh, oh no. <laughs> he was just like, yeah, this is this is kind of boring, isn't it? I'm like, it's like yeah. a Joel Schumacher watch seven he was just like i can do like a fourth of that i mean it's still pretty <laughs> fucked up i mean there's no happy ending to that but movie. there's a I lot of nicholas cage it, there's oh, a lot man. of scenes of nicholas cage watching fucked up shit and him having like intense reaction his hair reaction to be like oh god like yeah. why oh no I that's not my their... daughter yeah i do have a question emily is there a movie like eight millimeter do you see that and you're like if you're interested in something like that do you do like I should watch that, or I feel like we will probably cover that on the podcast sometime soon, so I should probably just not watch it and wait. <laughs> I feel like I do that now. You know what? It does look... I have to look at Letterbox because that's my brain, because I don't have room to remember anything anymore, but I did watch 8mm at the end of 2020. I don't... I liked it okay. But okay. yeah, no, I see, I, movies, I see movies like this, and I do think that I don't have the desire to 
unless it's something that's been on my watch list for a while, I don't have the desire to like seek them out because I do think that we will cover them. Yeah. Or I will seek them out because they cover that like the boys cover them before i join the podcast uh, and i'll be like oh yeah they talked about this one yeah. So. yeah you also work at scarecrow video which is like oh my god i've never been there but j- always to dream spot also oh best my god job that's where ever. you guys should all meet oh my god there we go we gotta get our plane <laughs> none tickets. of your guys's homes you guys should come <laughs> to seattle <laughs> yeah boston doesn't have uh many video stores left sadly i remember i kept yeah. there i lived across the street from a hollywood video that is now uh out of business and i all throughout college, I was like, are you guys hiring? And they just kind of like <laughs> no. laughed me off like, good heavens, no. <laughs> no. When, pe- when people start working at a video yeah. store, they're working there until they're dead in the ground. Uh, I, I'm so jealous of your job. <laughs> so, so jealous. <laughs> I went to a Suncoast when they were like going out of business. Oh God, Suncoast. I mean, yeah, they were going out of business. So it was the first time in their history that their prices were like actually normal. And, um, <laughs> And one of the signs behind it was just like, when when will you be closing? Blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, just said, don't ask our employees where they will be going after this job. And I was like, that sounds ominous. <laughs> <laughs> you're not, if you can't work at a video store, I'm sorry, you're dead. Uh, I don't yeah. know what to tell you. <laughs> but you did say that this, I mean, what we were talking about, just this movie has not made it past VHS. and But it was at Scarecrow. So I yeah, mean, we have it. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I I should have looked up the last time someone rented it. I wonder how if it has a good. <laughs> I wonder if people are uh, picking up Ladies Club. <laughs> well, wait till this yeah. episode drops in like two weeks. So we'll yeah, see. exactly. <laughs> yeah, it would just be one of us in a disguise, being like, "Oh yeah, I heard that podcast. Now I have to." <laughs> we, we're the that podcast. podcast is really really good. <laughs> yeah. we, we all become Vincent Adult Man. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Yes, you all meet for the first time at Scarecrow, but dressed as one um, adult man in a trench coat. Yeah. (laughs) It's perfect. Do your doors accommodate an 18-foot tall man? Is that possible? (laughs) We'll make it possible. Yeah, because Bryden's taller than most people. (laughs) That's a good way to say it. You're taller than most humans, right? <laughs> Brighton, how tall are you? I'm like 6'4". Yeah, it's ridiculous. taller than most people. <laughs> well, <laughs> there it is. Are you not allowed to ride certain roller coasters? <laughs> no, he has to ride, he has to ride yeah. them twice. <laughs> Instead of not being able to ride them, they make tall people ride them twice. <laughs> Brighton's job is to be at the very front row at the concert and just act like he doesn't hear anybody telling him to get the fuck out of the way. <laughs> What? What? No, I can't. Sorry, I can't hear you. Um, yeah, sorry. I'm trying to inject some humor into this uh, not funny movie and not funny topic, which I'm not gonna. No, it's pretty. Great. It's all it's in the tangents, tough. which is which is. I think you're doing that wisely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It's very sincere, though. I, I have to like say it's not. It's very flawed, but I did admire just how earnestly melodramatic some of it was which i thought mm-hmm. was you know they don't do that sort of like they don't make they don't make movies like that anymore i know that's such a boring <laughs> phrase but yeah well i mean there is a reason like i do enjoy a lifetime movie or two you yeah. know i i kind of like that stuff and and it did appeal to that part of me it just yeah tonally the the kind of chaos of the tone and and I kind of wanted it to commit more to the to mm-hmm. the violence of revenge, just but that's just like my personal preference. Like this could be someone's shit for sure. I yeah, don't know. that's fair. Yeah, absolutely. The ending is really like I guess the last thing. Um, I mean, would I, I? I feel like the ending is ambiguous because she gets the the guy at the end, but uh, she she like defeats him at the end. Um, but it seems like she's kind of she's not happy, and she's going to continue with the ladies' club and everything, you know, because she like. Calls Diana Scarwood, who then like says, "I've already found another doctor." <laughs> I already found another doctor. I wish it yeah. then like yeah. uh, she like winked and it like ding and then a freeze frame. <laughs> I mean, that been great. I mean, some this... guy just opens the door. It just cuts to her ringing a doorbell, and a guy opens the door and goes, "I'm a doctor." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, during this last like the climactic confrontation, there is like this Lalo Schifrin score has like these guitar licks. They're just like so terrible. It's like. <laughs> <laughs> you are, they don't have I love how obsessed aspect. with like, this you know, score you are. <laughs> you have to find the ladies club score on vinyl. And get it to, to <laughs> um, look at this record. This record sucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
you have Brian and because I, I I was in New York um last year for a friend's um bachelor party and they have this little exhibit at the Museum of the Moving Image where they have like clips of certain movies, lots of Scorsese movies where they're like how the tone of the movie is set with a oh, different score, rules. with a different score, and I'm just imagining Brian making it like you can't make a good movie with the Lady Clubs, <laughs> Ladies Club score, <laughs> just any movie would suck with the score. <laughs> I just fought back a second remember I was watching me guess. Imagine if you took all the new metal out of Swim Fan and you just put it with yeah. Don't <laughs> threaten don't, to take the new metal out of anything, yeah, especially I don't Swim Fan. That as a possibility. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's not a world I want to live in. It's like what if we took the new metal out of Little Nicky and be like, so what, we just have a bad movie? Like what, what <laughs> give me something to have that attached to. Um, speaking of uh, cable lifetime-ish movies, uh, Emily, I see here you have not seen Cyberbully from 2011. I think you need to oh rectify God. that. It's on um, my list. Okay, okay. <laughs> I completely forgot that movie stars Haley Joel Osment's sister, Emily Osment. Yeah, from Hannah Montana. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> And there is a, an incredible. I don't know why that's so amazing. To there's me. <laughs> an incredible sequence set to "Breathe Me" by Sia, which, of course, whenever I hear that song, I think of the finale of Six Feet Under. But then Cyberbully oh, yeah. came along, and uh, you're like, oh, oh my God. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just like that, I need to I need to watch the stock by my doctor like lifetime series with Eric Roberts that I've heard is like nuts, <laughs> like cyberbully adjacent, you know. I, I we were watching lifetime Christmas movies at um post at a post wedding when we were all in our hotel rooms last year, and we genuinely couldn't tell what time half the scenes took place in because the lighting is so bad. We were just like, it could either be 5 a.m. or 6 p.m. We have no idea. <laughs> Wait, there's two cyberbully movies. The one on my list is the one with Maisie Williams in it, but you're probably oh, talking shit. about the 2011 one. Yes, the 2011 yes. one where the two L's in the title are actually backslashes because it's, you know. That's cool. Now yeah, that's cool. Oh, that's, cool. Like, that's like, fu- that's like cool. you know, t- tired James <laughs> Cameron goes into a boardroom and writes Alien with a dollar sign. <laughs> 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 going to, go to a boardroom right side boy with the backside. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. You're hired. Here's like, I don't know, like a quarter of a million dollars because it's for TV. Um, yeah, this Maisie Williams one. Um, it's supposed to be kind of <sighs> fucked up. Oh, okay. Really? All right. I'll watch okay. it. I haven't seen her in anything outside of Game of Thrones, I <laughs> the think. The popular review on this um, is in, in this one, she's able to get the cap off. Uh, Charlie, you would know that. <laughs> That's fucked up. <laughs> it really is. Like, I watch that movie with, like, on a Saturday, Sunday afternoon with friends, pizza, and beer. It's the perfect way to watch that thing. It's just, it it, it truly is something to behold. <laughs> uh, anyways, what are we talking about? Uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, ladies Club. <laughs> so, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> what are we talking about? I'm sorry I differed. Ladies Club. Um, yeah, but I don't know. I feel like she, she's, like, it, it, them continuing the journey. That doesn't seem, like, necessarily, I mean... Karen Austin achieves a personal victory in anything, but she does. She seems like a bit ambivalent about like having to, uh, or a bit torn about having to continue feeling like she's continuing uh, the ladies' yeah. club with Scarlet. That's how I read the ending, which is why it's, I, yeah. yeah, it's kind of like what else can you do? You know, what kind of like should like should she accept? Like this, this is all the power that she has, and mm-hmm. so even though it's like kind of wrong and messed up and and messy, should she accept that this? is all she can do or should she not do anything if if those are the only two options that she sees you know yeah. i don't mm-hmm. know yeah not a great club to be in ladies club i don't i mean i feel like it would it just gets a little too complicated <laughs> i'm so, oh god <laughs> sounds like it's, it's pretty because... fucking nuts yeah <laughs> i'm um, sorry but no it's what's no that, nuts. what's that episode of the simpsons where bart and millhouse are like late to signing up to clubs <laughs> <laughs> and they everything's taken club. oh no ladies club yeah i think that's the one where bart does ballet right yeah. yes <laughs> yeah um i'm sorry this this <laughs> the only one I'm, that's left is the ladies club. i have Jesus. to mention this i've been trying not to mention it but laughing at the entire time um the guy this isn't funny the guy who does get off and whatnot and at the end she kills him and whatnot he remind he was like so over the top and like the i'm a crazy guy type thing he reminded me whenever um what is it <laughs> it's neil patrick harris plays bart simpson <laughs> remember that charlie <laughs> i do <laughs> 
I just can't Sorry. get away from these Simpsons references. <laughs> I know, I know. You, you, escaped, uh, you escaped suspense is killing us only to come here. I'm in the yeah. dark about a lot of it, too, because I wasn't allowed to watch Simpsons as a kid. So, like, I, I pick it up mostly from Kevin and Charlie and people I see on Twitter. Uh, I mean, I love it. I've seen up till season 10 or 12, like, the good stuff, but I haven't rewatched it in a super long time. Mm-hmm. So the, the rapid fire re- uh, references that I usually... You're like, yeah, I liked it. I'm just I, like, yeah. Um, yeah. That's not my personality <laughs> trait. And it's like, well, it's mine. I grew up with no friends. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, final thoughts on the ladies club. Anything else we would like to talk about? I mean, I do think it's ultimately worth checking out, as especially if you're, you know, in, interested in exploring this you know, genre. I, I think you could certainly do worse. <laughs> right, exactly. I wonder how the novel is. It's based on the novel The Sisterhood. I wonder if the novel yeah. is like if it focuses more on any of those uh genres that this kind of tries to cover. Mm-hmm. I think the novel actually just talks about a uh, pair of pants that they mail off to wait no, 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 that's a certain I, I, I know <laughs> that my brain went there too. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> But no, that's a good point. Uh, also, I guess the the director in 2006 wrote a book about uh, how to deal with divorce. Oh, so. that's interesting. Oh, okay. That's sad. Well, I mean, she probably felt good after writing it. I yeah, maybe like a more good person. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many books just called The Sisterhood that this is... This I is... know, I tried to look it up for a second, <laughs> and then I got overwhelmed and exited out of all the tabs I had. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Almost Major. Please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes. Please follow the pod on Twitter at Almost Major to keep up to date with what movies we will be covering in the future. Myself, I can be found on Twitter and Letterbox at Kev Bonesy. Bryden can be found on Twitter at Bryden Doyle and on Letterbox at J Doyle. Charlie can be found on Twitter and Letterbox at CT Nash91. Once again, thank you for listening.